So yeah, John chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper and the devil had already prompted prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his face and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash, except for the feet, to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. This is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens to you, you will, happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered him to him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas went out at once, and it was night. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, even before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me deny three times that you even know me. Thanks, Kay, for reading that for us. It was an extended reading, but 
um, I think it's a very beautiful one because it un encompasses uh, the Easter story. Hang on, sorry, I just have to <laughs> get myself together. <clears throat> You can see that from the title screen that I've entitled this Good Friday service, the message, you are loved with the love that made the world. Now, we are only just going to touch on a few things. Um, I want to talk briefly about three things, but I hope at the end of it that what you'll want to do is to dig deeply on any of these themes that we touch on and then contemplate them as we move into Easter Sunday. The first, <clears throat> um, I've, got three, um, I've got three points and you can write them down if you would like to. Um, and it starts with the darkness. If there was one word to describe it, it would be darkness. It's summarized by when Gay was reading. I don't know that if you heard it, but in verse 30 of chapter 13, it says, and Jesus went out and it was night. That is represented by the darkness. Secondly, we're going to touch on, we're going to major on love the love of Jesus, the love of God, encompasses the whole of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And I want, to, I want that to be brought out in what we talk about uh, today. And then finally, what happens when all that darkness meets all that love? And that is the contemplation of Jesus on the cross. So... <clears throat> I can't help when I was reading when I was choosing a passage uh, for someone to read out I was staggered by the reading of Jesus it's a passage of such tenderness love and the touch the touch as Jesus washed his disciples feet but then it is in the midst of this Judas darkness and it was night. This Easter, I have been overcome, really, I would say, by the brokenness, the darkness of the world. Good, Good Friday 2024 does bring our, our darkness out. This year, I saw three open wounds in our world that we need saving from on three different scales. On an international scale, we have years of war and hostility after the relative calm of decades. So that even in Jerusalem itself, there is terrible suffering today. And nearby, there is great famine produced not because of a lack of food, but by the presence, but by a lack of peace. And then on a national scale, and this is one that I want to kind of uh, tease out a bit, we've been overtaken by a, a brokenness that is appearing in the lives of our young people. Um, a sociologist whose work I follow quite um, deeply, his name is John uh, Jonathan Haidt, he has written a book called The Anxious Generation that came out on Tuesday this last week. And I'm already like more than half the way through it. <clears throat> That's the book there. But he speaks firstly of the anxious generation as being uh, consumed by a tidal wave of mental health issues. He, um, he specifies in particular the years 2010 to 2015. And it seems to be affecting the, the Western world um, almost equally in every way. Let me show you just a couple of um, graphs to show you. First of all, this is uh, data, and he has um, 40 or 50 of these graphs for you to look at, if you'd like to, at his website. 
Um, and you can see that there's a vertical line in the in the year 2012. Can you see there's a line that's a little bit darker? First of all, on the left, you can see psychological distress in Australia. And you can see the huge increase among, um, among our girls, 16 to 24. Look at that um, incredible rise, 74% since 2010. And in the US and the UK, it's more. And then I went across to New Zealand and and there's a, a graph, I could have got any of them really, but this was, um, they were asked the question, have you been diagnosed at a facility for with with a, a anxiety diagnosis? And you can see the way that that females from 2007, there's a little bit of a rise, but then it explodes geared around this 2010 to 2015 years until look at that rise. It's incredible. And John Haight believes that this, that this tidal wave has been brought about by two factors. The first one is the decline of play-based childhood. <clears throat> he says that starting in 1990, he has perceived that there was an increase in what's called safetyism, as parents in an in increasingly overprotective world became, um, became risk-averse in in a way that they weren't subjected to when they were growing up. Yet <laughs> what they would do at five to seven years old, their children are only being allowed to do at 11, 12 or 13. And he argues that this safetyism has brought about a removal of the low-scale risks of life. That would be bumps, bruises, cuts, um, uh, uh, face to face um, um, arguments, the sorts of things that are taught to children that are used to, that need to develop over years and years. But he says that this has been curtailed to just falling into adolescence or even later than that, the teenage years. And this has delayed development. But then he says that there has been a rise in a phone-based childhood. Early social media use, especially for girls, along with two things, the like button and a front-facing video camera, has in, and, and video games in place of outside play for boys, um, has meant that while we're being under overprotected for the outside world, we're being severely underprotected in the virtual world. And that this terrible exchange from play-based to phone-based childhood has wreaked these foundational harms from that from that graph that we saw, those graphs that we saw before. He says that it leads to four things social deprivation, sleep deprivation, attention fragmentation, and addiction. Um, that is the second open wound of the world. The third one is what I want to call a hyper-individualised hyper shame-based culture Michael Jensen wrote in his Easter devotion in today's Financial Review, Western culture has increasingly featured shame as an instrument of moral judgment. If we disapprove of what someone does, we seek to humiliate them by drumming up the indignation of the crowd. The target may be an elite boys' school covered up, um, accused of covering up bad behaviour, a trusted national brand suspected of squeezing small producers, or a spa sports star charged with racist abuse after a drunken night out. It may be a social influencer thought to have sent inappropriate texts to a minor, or a military hero alleged to have engaged in war crimes. 
It may be a church leader who turns out to have had a secret side. Whereas in the past we've lived in a, in a uh, culture largely based around guilt and innocence, now it seems that we, are a, we now become a shame-based culture. A shame-based culture where isolation is as a result of being um, being put on the outer, and it has led to even more bleakness among uh, who we are. But it is exactly in these three darknesses, personal, national, and international, that Easter meets us in our need. It was night could describe us, whether we're talking about ourselves, our families, or our countries. And I think where hope happens is at the transition of a verse like Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, but also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you hear the hope in that passage? Oh, sorry, Isaiah 57, 15. Yep, sorry, I don't have it uh, written on the, on the screen. It's such a beautiful passage. God is where hearts are broken. Do you know what that means? Yes, it is dark. Yes, we are broken. But Isaiah tells us that love is here, that God is here, and that he is close. As Michael Jensen says in his article at the end, Easter offers divine love beyond shame. God, as it turns out, is far less judgmental than we are. <laughs> A staggering quote. And this is my second point of love. Let's just read from John 1, 1 John 4. I could talk about John's gospel and John's letters being epistles and gospels of love but I don't have time to do that. So let's just read this verse as a summary. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending us his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. God is love. Theologian um, Emil Brunner made the comment that nothing like this declaration had ever been made in the history of the world, not by any culture at any time. He calls these three words by John the most daring statement that has been made in human language. He writes... God's love does not seek value, but it creates value. It does not desire to get, but to give. It is not attracted by some lovable quality, but it is poured out on those who are worthless and degraded. The way that um, one of my favourite authors, Francis Buffards, puts it, when he's talking about Jesus, when he was down here on earth, before the crucifixion. It's not a good day for Jesus when he wins lots of new followers or a bad day for him when he doesn't. Jesus' sense of people is not additive 
More is not better. Each person in front of him for that moment is the one missing sheep. And he is never disgusted. He never says that anything or anyone is too dirty to be touched, that anyone is too lost to be found. Even in situations where there seem to be no grounds for human hope, he will not agree that hope is gone. Wreckage may be written into the logic of the world, and that's the darkness that we talked about, but he will not agree that that is all there is. He says, more can be mended than you fear. Far more can be mended than you know. Beautiful words. And that is Easter. For me, I am loved by the love that made and sustains the world. And Easter is for you too. You are loved by the love that made and sustains the whole world. Jesus spoke the world into existence in love, but he touched the unclean and he allowed the unclean to touch him. The painter Caravaggio painted this called The Doubting of Thomas. And I want to just see, just just, uh, try to understand, and if it's not clear, then on the front you can look at the back screen. What a masterful depiction of love. His touch in washing the disciples' feet, but then after his resurrection, allowing himself to be touched. He was touched by the woman with the bleeding, by the shamed woman woman in Simon's house who kissed his feet. And then this incredible tenderness to Thomas. Look at the way that he grabs his arm and gently leads it to his own side. It's beautiful. No wonder Glenn Scrivener, in his Easter video this year, um, he he entitled it, Easter is for Atheists. But now we come to it, the third point. The, The wound that is there, it happened. So I want to now, a little bit differently maybe, I'm going to play a short video. It's going to be, Lyndon's going to cue it up and play it. It tells the story of the cross in terms of what Jordan Peterson, the person on the, the video, calls a limit story. And I just hope that perhaps it will help us try to understand what is happening um, in his heart as someone who really is a secular atheist, but coming to understand that the story of Jesus cuts to the very things of life. And what my prayer is, is that it will give us a fresh view of Easter. And then I'll close in prayer. Thanks. Thanks, Lyndon. Debated Oxford. You cannot write a more tragic story. It's impossible, technically. Why? Well, because it's a story of the aggregation of everything that people are afraid of. So there was no death more painful than crucifixion. That's why the Romans invented it, It was to punish political miscreants. It was the slow, agonizing death by suffocation, essentially, and and, and dehydration and exposure. It's extraordinarily painful. Okay, so that sucks. That's pain, man. Plus, you know it's coming. That's part of the story. Plus, your best friend betrayed you into it. Plus, your people turned against you. Plus, they're led by a tyrant who doubts truth. Plus, you're a victim of the Roman Empire. Plus, you're completely innocent. Plus, everybody knows it. Plus, they, they choose a criminal to be released from this experience instead of you, even though they know he's a criminal and they know you're innocent. So, and you're young. And you've done no wrong. And all you've done is help people. So it's a limit story. Okay, so then you think, we've been looking at that limit story for 2,000 years in the image and in the story. What are we doing? Well, you're supposed to visit the stations of the cross, let's say. Okay, here's the idea. You hear the crucifixion story, and you play with it. Who are you? Maybe if you're female, you're Mary, and why is that? It's the pieta. Because you have to offer your children to the destruction of the world. 
That's female courage. That's the mother that doesn't hold her child back. It's like, go out to what? Eventually your death and destruction. Go out, leave me, be in the world. That's feminine courage, man, to let her baby go. You're a pilot, you doubt truth, but you're, you'll go along with the crowd. You're Judas because you betray your best friend. You're the mob, you're the criminal. All of that, that's you. You look on all those things that you hate and are terrified by. That's like, that's not a snake. It's like the worst of all possible snakes everywhere. That's what you're looking at. And what do you see? You see death, you see destruction, pain, terror, tyranny, frailty, betrayal. Look harder, look harder, look harder. What do you see? The death and resurrection. You look far enough into the abyss, you see the light. Well, that's the story. That's the. <clears throat> now, of course, Jordan Peterson doesn't understand that this is God Himself coming. So, even more. What we have here is the ultimate story of love. And we are all of those participants, the, the brokenness of the world. And so many of the things I think that, that uh, Jordan Peterson sums up beautifully because he's come to heal us, but he's come to heal us. <laughs> The hope that Jesus brings is the hope that we cling to. But it was the hope that was so costly, that cost him on the cross. But he went through that darkness out into light. So we can come through Good Friday and emerge on Easter Sunday in resurrection I love so much that we had just, you know, just so recently our uh, baptisms of Joanne and Fred and Alex because they speak exactly of what Jesus calls us to do, to follow him into that place, but not with the hopelessness that it looked like for him, but with the hopefulness of resurrection to come. Let's just... Um, bow and pray and worship our Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, as we contemplate your um, love, we are overwhelmed by it because we see that it was, it was brought into our lives right at the dark times and I don't know, Lord, I think sometimes I've become numbed by um, the crucifixion, isolated by trying to think of um, the things that, that, um, that I've done that, um, that had brought about the crucifixion. But I'm just overwhelmed by... John 3.16, you loved the world. And I thank you that the crucifixion, Lord Jesus, has gone so far beyond its ability to heal me, but it goes so far as to the healing of the world itself. And we so look forward to when creation doesn't groan. We look forward to when you... Uh, your return brings about your peace, your, your, your flourishing. We look forward to it, Lord, with all of our hearts because we know that the thing that you do and are doing in our hearts is, is exactly what you can do um, in our country. And we look around at a world that needs you so much, Lord. Um, we pray that 
we might be able to spread that love in all the ways that you've given us to do so, that we might be known by love, that just as um, 1 John 4 states, that in, in us following you in love, that people will know us because we love like that. We love like you love. Lord, make it true in our hearts, in our lives. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for healing our brokenness. And thank you for what you're going to do as your kingdom comes. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.